Whether you're picking and grinning or just picking or just grinning, grab a drink, pull up a seat. It's time for Roots Music Rambler. Turn it up. So, uh, guess what we now have? Um, I, I don't know. Um, added weight from all the stuff we ate over the holidays. Well, that's true. But we also have Roots Music Rambler gear. I'm wearing our first official T-shirt for the show. And we now have a store on the website. So if you go to rootsmusicrambler.com slash store, we have this T-shirt. It's very comfy, by the way. Looking I was very sharp. peculiar on which type of shirt I chose for us. And I think I chose well. It was actually a recommendation of my son. Um, we have a hat, and uh, which is embroidered. So the logo is not as crisp because embroidery is kind of peculiar. Uh, and then we have stickers. So you can order stickers and put on your turntables or your computers or your, car. your best friend's ass or whatever you want to do. So Your Stanley Cup? Your, <laughs> yeah. You can put a Roots Music Rambler sticker on a Stanley Cup. That would be fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we've got different size stickers, right? Like there are options. I think there are. Yeah. I just ordered the, you know, just the little two and a half, three and a half yeah. inch, whatever that little circle thing was. Um, and we'll add more stuff to the store as time goes on. But um, our, our uh, you know, basically for lack of a better term, our tech guy, Chris Slater, who's a real good buddy of mine from uh, also grew up in Pikeville, Kentucky and Williamson, West Virginia, in that part of the world. Um, he ordered one to help me test the mechanism. He, he kind of does our website right. for us. He, he's he ordered, like the main man behind the scenes here. Yeah, he's the, he's the main man who makes all the plumbing work. So uh, he ordered one, and for whatever reason, his mother took it and framed it. And so we'll we'll that. we'll link to his. He did it posted on social media about it. So she framed the first edition Roots Music Rambler t-shirt. I hope we become a big enough show so that it's worth something one day. I was going to say, it might be popping up on eBay in <laughs> you know, a couple decades. Who knows? It's crazy. Here's the, here's the fun thing. What, what people won't, don't know until now, because I'm telling you all, is I literally went through, I think it was three different companies and maybe six or seven different iterations of this shirt to choose the right material, the right actual base shirt so that it was comfortable and big enough for big people because I'm a big people. And I wanted the sublimation, the printing to be the, the right type that wasn't going to peel off easily and whatnot. So there are actually about five or six versions of this shirt before I chose the right one in my closet right now. So maybe we'll auction those off at some point or for charity or some shit. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah. Giveaway. Um, I have some ideas for more merch, but we could talk about that off camera <laughs> or, you know, whatever. If anyone has suggestions. Sure. We'd yeah. We'll, to hear them. We will take suggestions. And, and I will tell you this. We have the ability to add all sorts of different types of shirts and hoodies and probably shorts and socks and mugs and all sorts of other things. And that's fine. But I wanted to just go out with, I wanted the, the right shirt. I wanted yeah, like the sure. perfect shirt in my opinion, which other people may not like the shirt I chose, but it's, it's a continuous comfort brand shirt, which is super soft and uh, flexible and doesn't shrink too bad in, in the wash and the printing is all right. So I, 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 I chose the shirt I wanted. If people want different types of shirts, different cuts, cause this is kind of a unisex cut. So we can, we can certainly add all that. Perfect. We we have merch. Yay! And you, merch and you is can, good. You can support the program by buying merch. I think we might get seventy eight cents for every shirt you buy, or something like that. I pri I tried to price them as low as I could so that we you know we're not trying to make a lot of money off this thing. No, it's, we're just no, of course. Thought it'd be cool for people to be out there wearing a Roots Music Rambler shirt. Oh, and by the way, uh, Nathan Graham, uh, who was one of our guests on the program. Uh, when he found out we were doing merch, he said, I want a shirt. And so we sent him one. So he has one. So cool I think it's see him, you know, yeah. rocking one of those shirts at one of his upcoming shows. I, I keep looking at his Instagram feed, hoping that he's going to be wearing the shirt in, in a shot at some point. So it's I don't basically know if it quite fits his onstage vibe. You know, he's a pretty 
Probably not. But Pretty dapper dresser. So yeah, it, it, maybe he'll show up in it someday in some post. Who knows? Um, so our families, Slater and his family, and. Nathan Graham right now are the only people that have these shirts. <laughs> so actually, I take that back. We did sell our first shirt to a non inner circle person last week. Happens to be a young lady that uh, Slater and I went to high school with. She bought one for her husband. So That's thank awesome. you, Christy Carter. You are awesome. There you go. Nice. Uh, so anyway, welcome to Roots Music Rambler. She's Frank. He's falls. And we're rambling on through the stories behind the music we love. And today on the show, we welcome Sarah Jean Stevens. We're pretty excited about this. Sarah Jean is a local country artist, well, local to me. She's from Illinois, as I am. And I was first introduced to Sarah Jean and her music via Nathan Graham. Uh, he, his name comes up a lot on this show. Um, so if you'll remember... Nathan had his album release show slash party back in October and Sarah Jean was the supporting opening act. And um, there's a lot to be said for those artists and bands that open up for others, uh, which is how I first found Nathan Graham because he opened for drive by truckers. Mm -hmm. So um, Sarah, I, you know, really enjoyed her set and, um, after Jason and I talked about it, we we're like, yeah, let's get her on the show. So, yeah. uh, what's, what's cool though, is, you know, she, she's a musician, songwriter, and so much more, you know, since we, you know, confirmed, um, booked her for the show, I have learned so much more about her and just how talented she is. Um, so we'll talk more about that when Sarah yeah. Jean joins us, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool. She's impressive. Well, and I think those of you who uh, like the same types of, of music we like, the people who listen to the show or watch the show are going to like her a lot. She's truly an Americana artist. She's probably based in country, but then sort of has a lot of blues influence and all that good stuff. So uh, she will be coming up uh, on the show today. Before we kick it all off, though. So I have I had a question. I was thinking about this the other day, and I want to know, Frank, um, have you ever, A, have you ever been in a band uh, even just to, you know, kids on the, in the neighborhood and, and what is your stance on, or have you ever sung in public? Okay. Um, well, I, I've never been in a band that that's, I can answer definitively. Um, and have I sung in public? Yes. Was that probably, was that a good idea? Probably not. Um, <laughs> You know, usually there were uh, copious, copious amounts of alcohol involved. Uh, the last performance I gave, though, was at Tom's friend's like Labor Day party. His friend's in a band, actually, um, and they have this huge Labor Day party every year um, at his dad's house. And uh, the band plays. They're called The Five. Um, so they play. And we had been drinking for many hours. And... <laughs> One of their coworkers was like, let's sing La Bamba. And, you know, being the Spanish teacher that I am, um, I jumped at the opportunity and there, I think it might still be out there. There's a video on YouTube of oh. me and a couple other people rocking out to La Bamba. Um, I look very confident, uh, but if you listen closely, <laughs> who boy. Nice. All right, Tom, you have an assignment. Make sure I get the link to this damn video so that we can put it in the show notes. So there you go, Tom. Oh, you, no, please. I don't need you my always want us to talk about it. you on the show, Tom. So hook <laughs> us up with the link, Tom. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, um, we did some karaoke on New Year's Eve. That was a hoot and a holler. No, well, sure. Uh, yeah, we did it at my brother's house. His friends showed up with this giant setup, like speakers and two microphones. And it was very <laughs> professional. Wow. Um, and so my sister is actually a really good singer. She's got the voice in the family. Okay. And um, so she can, she knocks it out, right? Um, so I'm just kind of like always in the background, like doing the little harmonies. Nice. Um yeah, so we we sing Shoop. Okay, well, that's a, that's a that's a good karaoke song for a group of people. So I think I told How about my, you. Well, I think I told my karaoke story a couple of episodes ago. Uh, at least that I the only uh, thing I normally do karaoke is gin and juice. Um, oh, right. And and I always do. I ask the the DJ to let me do the first verse 
of the uh, the Gourds bluegrass version acapella before we kick into the Snoop Dogg version, which if you ever get a chance to see that, I, I mean, you know, I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not humble about this at all. It, it'll blow the roof off the joint like it's pretty good. I, I've done it enough times that it's pretty good, but oh. I don't do anything else because I'm terrible. I'm just not a very good singer. Um, as for being in a band, when I was probably, God, I don't know, 12 or 13, uh, me and my friend Bill, uh, who this wasn't why we didn't end up having the band. He eventually moved to Florida. So I, I didn't even, I lost track of him, but he came over to my house. I had a big drum set. I was a drummer. That's all, the only thing I've ever had the talent to play was the drum. I could keep a beat, but that's about it. And I had this big soundboard and sound system, and I don't even remember how I got it. It was my stepdad got it from somebody. I think he was like holding on to it for someone. But I figured out how to wire it, hook it up in my bedroom. So I had this big, like, 16-track soundboard and these huge, huge amplifiers. And so Bill came over with his guitar, and um, he knew how to play basically rhythm guitar more than anything else. And again, 12, 13 years old, and I knew how to play drums. And so we rehearsed one song and and traded off singing it to see who we thought would be the better singer. And I think we only did the rehearsal was we had we had one rehearsal and we never really did it again. But we we were dead set on starting a band. But we rehearsed one song and I will give you ten thousand dollars if you can name it on one try. Which song two 12 year olds in this would have been uh, 1985, I think, maybe 1986. Uh, and we rehearsed one song, a uh, simple song to learn how to play as a band with a rhythm guitar and a drum set. I'll give you one guess. First first song to come to mind is Born in the USA. Oh, that's a, that's a good guess. That's a good guess. But no, it was, alas, Lose Your Love by the Outfield. Or Your Love. The name of the song is Your Love. I don't, don't want to lose your, your love tonight. We we learned how to play that. That's a pop. So I think we learned it because he kind of knew the chords and knew how to play it on guitar. Okay. And for me, it was just, okay, well, I can get the beat down. So we played it six or eight times and both took turns singing it. And that was the extent of my uh, band band experience. I did march uh, in the marching band one time. I did one parade. And they put me on the big bass drum. And when it was over, I put it down and I couldn't feel my feet. And I said, I'm never doing that again. So that was it. You know, that it does look um, uncomfortable, <laughs> cumbersome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I often wonder about the, the the percussion, the drum people in the marching bands. <laughs> you you got to have a lot of strength, especially back. Your core has to be yeah tight. And it, anybody who looks at me knows exactly there's nothing about my core that is tight. Nothing at all so oh. <laughs> that was uh that was not gonna happen so anyway that's because right, you're 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 what smooth as butter and built like a tank exactly that's exactly i'm i'm uh what is it smooth as yeah smooth as smooth as a no smooth as a yeah butter is that right i don't know that's the muskox thing which you're about to hear a commercial from so i probably say it in the commercial so you'll 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 hear that Anyway, we're sipping on a bourbon and I'm out, so we'll take a quick break for a refill. Take a moment, if you will, listen to more about the awesome sponsors that help make the show happen, including uh, Muskox. Here's their wonderful, sexy flannels. We love these. I now have four of them, and I'm getting more. So I love these wow. things. They're amazing. They feel so nice. They're comfy. I like them. Anyway, that's us. This is Roots Music Rambler. That's uh, Sarah Jean Stevens, and that song is By Your Side. That's from her uh, EP, I think, Working Mother, which we're going to talk a lot more about because she joins us today on Roots Music Rambler. Sarah Jean, how are you? I'm awesome. How are you guys? 
We're great. We're great. Excited to have you here. Um, so uh, that was uh, obviously from Working Mother. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about the that album really quickly or that EP really quickly. The theme, obviously, uh, of Working Mother. Let's get into that. So where did that uh, inspiration for that come from? Uh, my old band was called Working Mother, and uh, we had just recorded at Flat Black in Iowa, and we were reading the newspapers over, it was like leap year weekend, and it was like coronavirus, something, 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 and we're like, I think something bad's about to happen, and sure enough, like two weeks later, lockdown came into place, which uh, tanked that band. Um, by the time I was ready, things started to open up, and I was ready to play music again. I had waited till my two littlest kids could be vaccinated, because the vaccine for the little ones was the last one to roll out. And once they were vaccinated, I was ready to play. I had a ton of new music. Um, some of the other band members weren't uh, ready to play yet. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to start playing solo, I guess. And Which has actually been pretty interesting because now I can play solo as a duo, trio, full band, which is awesome. Um, and then I kind of took some of my working mother songs that we had recorded as a full band and rebranded it under working mother for the name of the solo EP. Very nice. I like I like that theme. I like the name. I like the theme because I too am a working mother. Yes. And um, if if you don't know, that was uh, the predecessor to Roots Music Rambler was my travel blog called The Working that. Mom's Travels. Yep. yep. So you know, um, <laughs> it, it it's not easy. It's not easy being a mom, a working mom, and then having like a side gig, right? Like you're yep. a musician and an artist overall, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then I had my traveling and my writing going on. So um, when I saw that, I was like, yes, yes, Sarah Jean, well, right? Working Mother was a fun so, band. We took a little detour during COVID. So but here we are now. Yeah. yeah still Working yeah, Mother. We, so. <laughs> very good. Yeah. That, yeah. that song, I, that, that song is really nice. Um, so you are from Illinois. Right. Mm -hmm. Where, where in Illinois? You, you grew up on a horse farm? I did. I grew up on a horse farm in Woodstock, Illinois. It's Northern Illinois. Uh, got out as soon as I could when I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> Went to college for a hot second and then traveled for about five years, moved back to Chicago. And then uh, my husband and I met in Chicago, got pregnant, did the whole migrate to the first available suburb, which was Forest Park. And then we lived in Berwyn for about five years. And I still travel back there a lot to work and stuff. But, uh, during COVID, we really wanted to look at trees and have nature, and we needed a bigger house because we had three kids at that point, and we found this house in Crystal Lake, so I moved back home, essentially. Crystal Lake's a town over from Woodstock, so I was a little uh, a little trepidation about doing that, but it's been amazing, and every time we come home and look at our trees, we're, we rem are reminded of why we did it, <laughs> so, so we're not oh, in Chicago nice. anymore, so I travel back into the city for band practice and shows and all the good stuff. Yeah, Crystal Lake's out there. You know, it's not an exactly hour without traffic. So with yeah. traffic, it sucks. Wow. With, are you, are you able to are, are you able to take the train at least? Um, I'm a painter, so I have a truck full of gear. So no, <laughs> my husband okay. does take the train back in when he goes to work. So yeah. And then, so growing up on the horse farm. What kind of music were you hearing? What was being played? What were you listening to? Is it the stereotypical stuff that, you know? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. We, uh, my parents were uh, hippies. So my dad was Moody Blues and a lot of those types of bands. Um, oh, what's the band? Do you mean? Buffalo Springfield, stuff like that. My mom was very yeah. much Joni Mitchell, Carol King, those kinds of singer songwriter, female types, which has stuck with me my whole life but then we were really into that late 80s early 90s country situation so a lot of katie lang uh clint black garth brooks i remember growing up at the farm they would have all their friends over and have line dancing lessons in the dining room nice on uh, but we read horse shows every weekend so very much living that farm girl life yeah <laughs> <laughs> very nice very nice so i can now that you've talked about your influences or what you grew up listening to i can hear that right in your music um and see how you made that connection so <laughs> jason mentioned a little while ago i don't know if we were on air yet about you um your previous band okay because i was going to ask you you know what other instruments do you play and turns out you 
play bass as well. And what was that project yeah. all about? Um, I played bass in a couple projects, actually. I spent a lot of time playing in other people's bands and uh, played bass. I would not call myself a bass player. Let's, that's being generous to say I even play the bass. But uh, I played bass um, a couple different Chicago projects, Streets on Fire, and what else was there? Oh, I don't even know, but I wouldn't, I, no, I would not call myself a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> I traveled with a band right. called Bleached, Bleached out of L.A. Um, I flew out. A friend of mine was friends with their manager, and they needed a bass player. So I flew out on a one-way ticket to L.A. and kind of learned a couple of their songs and did the audition. And then three days later, uh, we left for tour and played, like, 14 shows in three days at South by Southwest and wow. a bunch of stuff. And eventually went over to Europe and did some some big tour over there and did a residency at North by Northeast in Toronto. So that was about 11 years ago. But that was very so they're, much They're like, a punk band, aren't they not? Yeah, I mean, I was, I had a mohawk and did my rebellious thing. <laughs> so a lot of my other influences are like the slits, the cramps, x-ray specs, you know. All right. Misfits. So it wasn't far off. It wasn't off track. <laughs> but, That's uh, good. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. I can't funny. imagine you with a mohawk. <laughs> I just posted a photo of it. Maybe it was in my stories anyway. I can, I can, oh, I, can, I must have missed it. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can see that. I'm curious, though. So you grow up on a horse farm. You're listening to a lot of country music. You're now, for lack of a better description, and I think this is how you describe yourself, you're kind of an Americana artist. You, you know, singer, songwriter, mm -hmm. country is in there and whatnot. Yeah. Where does the punk come from? Was that just a phase or was it, were, are you more eclectic with your musical I background? Know. I feel like those alternative scenes there's so much crossover you know and i feel like punks and hippies aren't too far apart in the, the grand scheme of things with their their ideals and stuff like that so i don't know i don't think it was too off base i i just uh was different i got bullied real bad in high school living in a small town and i was an exchange student to germany my junior year and started collecting piercings and colored my hair all sorts of crazy stuff came home with purple hair and all these piercings and everybody was very shocked um, except my mom, who was always very supportive. And, uh, yeah, I think that sort of snowballed into a mohawk at some point. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's fine. It was fine. We all go through our phases. My daughter has a half shade head now. She's eight years old. So Nice. I like it. Well, uh, So did anything from that, I'll just continue to call it a phase, even though I, no disrespect to the phase. <laughs> Uh, but did anything from that phase kind of inform your either performance or your songwriting and music writing now? I think, well, yeah, I would say that, you know, I've had many people come up to me after shows and say, well, how, what kind of music would you call this? And I think Americana, you know, is just sort of a nice umbrella, but it's, I don't, I'm not making the music to fall under a certain category. I guess. So if there's, I don't know if you can hear any of my old punk influences in any of what I'm doing, but I think it's more of like, I'm just making my art and it happens to lean into this, you know, I like pedal steel on my songs and I have very melodic vocals. So there's not a lot of screaming going on. No, but I, <laughs> I think the, the underlying idea behind just making your art um, without really caring what anybody says about it has been such a blessing. I turned 40 and was like, you know what? I'm, I don't have to like be part of a certain scene. I'm just going to do what I do. And this is because I need to do it. And if other people like it, that is like the ultimate blessing, you know? So I don't know. So no, sure. I don't think you probably hear any punk influences except the attitude behind it, which is, I'm just going to make it for me. <laughs> if you like it, yay. <laughs> well, we, we definitely love the attitude. Now, when I, the first time I heard you heard your name, you know, was when you opened for Nathan Graham at his uh, his record release party slash show. And you made a comment in your set and you said that your music sounds like and I can't remember the exact words. And I hope you do, because I cackled. Um, but you said something about uh, like a bingo game and an 80s prom. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, I do. Um, I. I love the musicians I get to play music with are 
Just the best. Melissa Kempfrempe is Chris Anderson's my lead guitarist. We've got Will Phelan and Tommy McGettrick play steel. We've drummed with Jamie Gallagher and Ryan uh, Drivik. And God bless them because I'll show up and be like, here's this new song. Um, I need this middle section to sound like a 1950s prom in the wild, wild west. And they're like, <laughs> okay. Or like we played um, Thalia Hall recently and poor Paul, the sound guy for our monitors. I was like, if you could make my vocals sound like a tumbleweed covered in diamonds. And he's like, okay, <laughs> it's dumb. Very descriptive. Wow. So they hang in there, you know, they hang oh. in there. You know, when Jason, when she said that, I seriously, <laughs> it was one of those moments where I'm like, I wish I would just happen to be recording because it was so hilarious. Um, but then it made sense though, you know, like it, she wasn't off too far off base with that description. <laughs> so yeah, that was great. Um, that, and that song, and then, that's going to be on the uh, new EP. That one's called Smoky Mountain. Oh. <laughs> so Love you it. We live that moment. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Another thing you said too that during that set was um, before you played a song, you said that your husband had started writing it when you guys were camping in the Smokies Same or something, song. and you said Same you song. stole it. <laughs> he is he plays so, music too. He plays music too, and he had come up with this little ditty, and I was like, that's that's kind of catchy. But then I like t turned it into like a minor key and, and changed it a little bit, and he still thinks he deserves. Uh, royalties on that one so we we'll wouldn't have it but it's actually the same song smoking on water okay <laughs> okay yeah so yeah right before that song she hit all of these you know these one-liners out of the park and i was no. just like I love awkward i'm awkward on stage it's bad bad banter no bad not at banter. All. <laughs> that's great well I mean, we that it gives us something to look forward to with the new ep which i know we'll get into uh, a little bit more. We're going to step out and take a break right now. We're talking to Sarah Jean Stevens. Uh, before we go to break, though, I want to play another cut from uh, Working Mother, uh, and we'll play a few more of her songs here on the show. Uh, this is West Wind. Feel the West Wind turn. It blows past everyone. Sky. You call your daddy, your daddy wasn't home Then you call your mom, she said, baby, what you do? First you call your daddy, but your daddy wasn't home Then you call your mom, she said, baby, what you done? That's Deadwood, a uh, single from Sarah Jean Stevens, who joins us this week on Roots uh, Music Rambler. Before the break, we were talking about her eclectic music background, which included uh, a stint uh, playing some punk music and having a mohawk and all that good stuff. So here's my question as a follow-up to that, Sarah Jean. It, you know, you're, you're at the point in your career where you're playing, you know, you're, you're getting some opening gigs for some pretty significant artists, which is awesome, but you're probably still playing a lot of bars, a lot of clubs. I'm curious if when you're looking out and the crowd's a little kind of dull and kind of sleepy and you don't say, turn around to the band and say, okay, uh, I want to be sedated. Let's go. And just fucking blow them up and, and go punk on them. Have I done that? Yeah. No. Do you want to? Do I want to? <laughs> oh, you know, when it's a, it's a I played for a very sleepy adult older crowd recently in the last year and they were all seated so everyone was at tables and it was, ooh, it was very quiet and they just sat there very politely and stared and it felt like a really bad open mic <laughs> it was like i was like oh please are they are they breathing i couldn't tell um but you know you gotta you're gonna have those crowds sometimes so let's take it as it comes that's when you should bust out the <laughs> Would you ever believe that I had a mohawk? Yeah. Yeah. No, they didn't appreciate <laughs> That'll it. That'll wake them up. There were no jokes landing for that crowd. So, oh. oh, wow. That's tough. That's tough. Yeah. Oh. So, 
the crowd when I saw you at Fitzgerald's was um, I think everybody was kind of in good spirits. Right. Yeah. And I, I have to tell you, Jason, and for everybody who's listening, when Sarah Jean came out on stage, the first thing that I noticed was her hair. And for those of you who are just listening, you're not watching the video. Sarah Jean has the <laughs> most gorgeous, luscious, this mane of hair that is perfectly layered. And, you know, I'm just looking at her going, I am so envious. I mean, just just perfect. And then I come to find out that you that's part of, you know, what else you do, right? Like you oh, yeah. write music, you play music, but you're also a hair and makeup artist. Yeah, for a long time. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so then it, it it was making sense. Hopefully, people and can then, cast the hair and like hear the music. <laughs> it was a great first it. impression. Oh, it was well, a great first impression. I'm like, you. I love this. I, <laughs> I love her hair. Um, and then, so what kind of projects have you worked on in, in that arena? Oh, hair and makeup. Anything that we might be familiar with? Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh... A very long career. I'm not done with it. I still take hair and makeup jobs. I just had pivoted to painting about six years ago because I was tired of literally being in people's faces for a career. <laughs> and so I started <laughs> painting more and I'm very choosy about the hair and makeup jobs I take. But, you know, I did my okay. favorite work was always music videos and photo shoots. Um, Flogging Molly came to town and I got to style their photo shoot a couple years ago, which was nice. Oh, nice. They're just Fun. the nicest. Um, but you know, there's been some fun celebrities got to groom Rip Daniels of Spoon for Lollapalooza one year and he gave us his artist passes. So we just got to hang out and, you know, there's been some pretty amazing gigs for hair and makeup. So I haven't kicked it to the curb. I'm just very, very choosy. So any musician sure. friends, I love doing music videos. So if you guys <laughs> hire me for your music videos. Um, but yeah, it was, it's been a, a long and amazing freelance career. So. Francesca keeps telling me I need hair and makeup. I disagree. But I don't, this is, well, you did. Why you mess with makeup this? Why mess with perfection? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, look at this, people. Come on. That's that's, that's, that's Ooh, experience Sarah, right there. She's scoring some points, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then you're painting. Yeah. So I saw this beautiful mural that you that you painted in Oak Park, which mm -hmm. Jason, mm -hmm. you probably mm -hmm. aren't familiar mm -hmm. with Oak Park, Illinois, but mm -hmm. it's yeah. um. It's a very near suburb of Chicago, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's one, like, if I had a choice growing up, um, like, where I could live, I mean, I grew up in the middle of the city, but, like, I would love to have lived in Oak Park, yeah. right? Just that, like, Ernest Hemingway was born there, Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. so um, there's those claims to fame and just really, like, old, gorgeous houses yeah. Um, and then side note, my brother played ice hockey for the team in Oak Park. So we were there all the time, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, you're painting. So you do public art like that. You have your own mm -hmm. company, any other media, like tell us all about this because I am genuinely, not only am I envious of your hair, but I'm also envious of all your, your creative talent. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate it so much because like I've been to musicals and stuff and where I just start crying mm -hmm. because the people are so talented and good at what they do. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I'm not good at anything like that. So I really, really appreciate, yeah. you know, when people like are masters in these crafts. Right. So I genuinely want to know more about your painting. I was a musical and theater other... kid too. That was a big part of my, my past as well. But you no, know, with the painting, it, you know, started, I, I do paint on canvases had never really thought to, do much as far as selling them or having art shows. But when I started my interior painting company, you know, I do boring paint a bedroom, you know, stuff like that. And then the transition to large scale wall murals was very natural and easy for me. So I started doing that. And, you know, I did the, did you see the Betty White mural? Is that the one you were talking about? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I did the Betty White mural. I was chosen um, Oak, Park, Oak Park Arts Council, put out a call for a Betty White mural. So I submitted my design and got chosen. But I painted yeah. all over. I did the the big logo at Fitzgerald's on the back of the stage. I hand painted that. The baby gold at the top of their restaurant. I did that. Lots, so many Oak Park clients because we lived out there for so long. And right, just lots of interior murals. You know, COVID came, and thank God I had pivoted from hair and makeup because everyone started doing house projects, and I painted a ton of Zoom backgrounds, and everyone wanted everything repainted. So it was really I never stopped working through the pandemic. I'm not done. It was very, very. Lucky. Oh. Um, 
But yeah, so I'm still doing that. I've been out this way. I've painted a ton of murals at my kids' elementary school, school which was very fulfilling. And, you know, I'm sure. All my stuff is very colorful and bright, so... I've, I've noticed there's there I have a, a an influencer if you will that I've worked with here because in my day jobs in marketing and I work with uh, influencers and content creators a lot and there's one here in, in Lexington Kentucky named Wiley Cottle and uh, he has become known as a muralist I mean mm -hmm. he he does them all over the place for various businesses yeah. and they're very trendy and popular here in this part of the world. So yeah. I would think that that's probably a byproduct of being popular elsewhere. So I would Ooh. think that that's probably a good business to be in right now. It's really fun. <laughs> it's a really fun <laughs> business to be in. Hard. I mean, I stepped off a ladder wrong in December and sprained my foot. So Ow. <laughs> there's a lot, a lot happened in 2023. <laughs> yeah. I actually reached out to Wiley recently because uh, my girlfriend, Karen, uh, really liked some of his work. I showed him to her and she was like, ooh, I really like this thing that he's doing yeah. here. And so I actually reached out to him and said, hey, uh, how much would a 17 by 20 wall in her house cost? So he's quoted me a cost to mural her house up. I don't think I can afford it, though. I was going to say, that's a big wall. <laughs> it's a big, a big wall, wall, and he's he's good. He's pretty expensive. Yeah. So but anyway, cool. Yeah. So can we see your artwork oh, anywhere? Yeah. Like where uh, can we find? My Instagram is what keeps the most current. Moth and Moon Co. Moth and Moon Co. Yeah. All right. We'll make sure there's a link to that uh, in the show notes for sure. So you can see the murals. And of course, we'll you know link to her Instagram, her other Instagram and all that stuff. So you can find the music as well. Uh, we're going to uh, step out, take another quick break here. Uh, we're talking to Sarah Jean Stevens. And of course, as we go to break here, we... Uh, like to play a little of the artist's music. So you can hear a little snippet of that and get inspired to go download and subscribe and purchase and all that good stuff. Uh, this one, uh, I'm going to have to ask the, the, the song that I'm going to play here is called Harlan song. I'm curious what the, uh, the origin of that song is because there's a Harlan, Kentucky. Yeah. And I'm, I, know. I just thought I'd ask. Um, well, it's not about Kentucky. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> my, middle, I'll forgive you. My middle child is named Harlan and he is, Oh, cool. Uh, <clears throat> A lot of my songs were about my daughter, my firstborn, and my son Harlan was a very early talker. And so at three years old, he kept, you know, he very much understood that these other songs were about his sister. And he was just on my ass about <laughs> writing him a song <laughs> at three years old, like, where's my song? And I'm like, oh, you're so, I'm sorry. Okay. So I wrote Harlan's song for him. And then he has another song that will be, oh, we haven't recorded it yet. It'll be on the full length later this year. Um, called galaxy eyes because he's just got the most beautiful eye anyway so he got his song and he's our little nice. sensitive poet and that one's his first one. <laughs> that's nice. adorable yeah. that is adorable well and and by the way francesca my new nickname for tom is going to be harlan because he always asks about being mentioned on the show <laughs> so you can tell him that so anyway here's harlan's song from sarah jean stevens on roots music rambler That is Back to the Land by Sarah Jean Stevens. Uh, yeehaw provided by me. Sorry about that. I'm probably ruining <laughs> the for everybody. 
Uh, but you know, when you feel it, you feel it. Uh, so uh, we, we before the break, we were uh, talking a little bit about Harlan's song, which is about your your son. But then during the break, uh, uh, Sarah Jean volunteered and said, "I can't believe you didn't ask me about." what Deadwood was about. I said, well, you just opened up that can. So Sarah Jean Stevens, tell us about Deadwood. What's that song about? Yes. Yeah, well, the tea. Uh, in one of my many travels, I was living in uh, South Dakota, as one does on their travels. And I was playing with a band in Spearfish, which was a college town. I was living in Rapid City, and I went to drive to band practice one night and ran out of gas on that stretch of 90. And it was wintertime. It was right before Christmas. And I called my bandmate. They were bringing me gas. And in the meantime, a cop car pulls up, cruiser, and he was like, is everything okay? And I said, yeah, I just ran out of gas. Uh, my friend is on the way. And he goes, well, why don't you come sit in the car and get warm? And I was like, okay. So I did. And he's like, mind <laughs> if I run your license? And I was like, okay, because I didn't have anything wrong with my record as far as I knew. And he was like, he ran my license and he was like, you ever been to jail? And I was like, no, man, what? And he goes, I'm going to have to handcuff you and take you to the station. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he, I was, I had a suspended license in Illinois that I didn't know about. And there was like a lapse of insurance on the car. So he handcuffed me oh, in the no. front seat of his cruiser and took me Come to on. jail in Deadwood, South Dakota, which is very much like the TV show did with South Dakota. It's like this crazy little gambling town in the foothills of the Black <laughs> the Black Hills in South Dakota. And it was snowing, and he's telling me all about what he's going to buy his kids for Christmas. And I was just like, I don't know what's happening. And I was in jail for like four days, and my mom and dad wouldn't bail me out. They didn't understand what was happening. They thought I had done something bad. And I was like, no, oh, it was like a traffic thing, which all eventually got dropped in court. So uh, I'm a good person. My daughter, upon hearing the song about me going to jail, was very concerned that I had done something very bad. So I had to <laughs> calm her down and tell her, no, it's just silly, a silly traffic thing. But I got the uh, full jail experience and it was not for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I think that's good. But one, so. <laughs> add some street cred there. I, yeah, I don't I don't think you can be an accomplished, at least country artist these days if you haven't at least spent a couple nights in the in the slammer. So. Oh. Congratulations. You earned Thank your you. merit badge. Thank you. So dumb. So dumb. <laughs> so you had, we had, you had mentioned uh, previously uh, a couple times here in the conversation that you are uh, currently working on an EP mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe even uh, an LP later in the year. So tell us about the current project you're working on and how that's coming together. Uh, the new one is almost done, except I recorded in December of 2022. So just a little over a year ago, I went down to... Water Valley, Mississippi, to Matt Patton's studio called Dialback Sound. And um, that all happened very organically. So I went down there for a couple of days, recorded five songs, four of which will be on an upcoming EP. Um, I did not book enough time down there to get everything done. So he, uh, Bronson, shipped the stems to Will Phelan, my pedal steel player, who's got a home studio. And we have slowly over the last year, very slowly, uh, finish the song. So he just sent me the final mixes last night. We're about to send them off to get mastered uh, with Mike Hagler over King Size. And I'm hoping to, I'm, I could release it probably pretty soon, but I think I'm going to shoot for a Valentine's Day release date. Okay. So four songs, Matt That's Patton's exciting. playing bass on them, which is like, you know. Wow. It's Matt Patton. Matt, Matt, <laughs> Matt Patton, the happiest bass player in the land. Literally just the yeah. nicest for the, person. For Nice for those people who don't quite know who Matt Patton is, he would be the bass player for the drive-by truckers, who I think we've mentioned on every episode of the show. I was I'm like, pretty I'm pretty sure, sure they only want me on this podcast because they know I recorded with Matt Patton. That's my <laughs> no. Thing that they, that's yeah. so not true, Sarah Jean. <laughs> we I, I, we did not even know that she was recording with Matt Patton until like a couple of days ago. This was booked weeks back, no, so joking. she's joking. full of shit. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, I no. did know, but that's not why. Okay. And then I had also oh, had yeah. um, Travis, the guitar player for a band called the Serotones, drove over from, oh gosh, where does he live? New Orleans? No. Oh, I'm going to say something wrong. He drove from far, <laughs> five hours to come record some guitar on there. And then coming back here, all the vocals and drums and bass and a lot of guitar was recorded down in Dialback Sound. And then... Uh, Will Phelan puts a pedal steel on it. Chris Anderson, my lead guitarist, recorded on it and is 
Oh, I'm so excited. Finally, it's been over a year now, but you know, 2023 was a year and it's almost done. So very excited about that. And then I'm hoping I've got too many songs backed up. So hopefully end of summer, fall, we'll schedule some time to record a full length up here. That's fantastic. So tell us a little bit about working with Matt Patton. I mean, somebody with that kind of resume and he's obviously got his own studio. I'm sure he brings a lot of experience and, you know, a lot of probably creative energy to the, to the project. What was it like to work with him and and how did he affect the project that you thought you were going into now looking back on it? Um, He, I mean, when Bronson, the engineer was like, I'm, yeah, Matt's going to play bass. And I was like, Matt Patton. <laughs> okay, no pressure. Um, but he literally, Matt, has, we were just texting the other day too. He is one of the nicest people I've ever played music with. I mean, I dearly missed my bass player, Melissa, but I, Matt Patton was a pretty good sub. So he just, <laughs> everybody just like nailed the parts and we tweaked some stuff up here on the back end after we sent the stems up and have been mixing and stuff. But it was just, it was lovely. He was, he was telling me now he's working with Laura Jane Grace down there and he's like, come on back, blah, blah, blah. I need time. And he's very nice. So good connections, good connections. I'll say. And his bass sounded great. The songs are really pretty dreamy. Like it's, I don't even know how to describe it. You'll, you guys will hear it. Give it a month. Okay. Come out in a month. (laughs) I definitely can't wait to hear it. And well, too, because I know that 2023 wasn't your favorite year, you know? So like, Finally releasing this yeah. EP, I'm sure, is going to involve a whole lot of emotion um, for you. And um, yeah, we're just we're just excited for you Thanks. and to finally hear it. Thanks. It was, you know, I once I played my I played my first solo show on 420. <laughs> uh, it'll be <laughs> two years uh, this April. So really just a very short little solo career so far but has been jam-packed with you know like you said I've opened for some unbelievable bands and have had these amazing opportunities and I'm just taking it all in and staying the course (laughs) there you go what what's I'm curious what's that what's it like I mean what what goes through your mind when you sit back now and you say okay my solo career has only been really going on for a year or two And I'm opening for some significant recording artists who have a name, who have an audience. Like there are a lot of people who have to play shitty dive bars for 10 years before they ever get those opportunities. I played shitty dive bars for 10 years. I'm that's the thing. Like I'm not new to music. Somebody was like, you just came out of nowhere. And I'm like, I've been here. Like I've been playing in all these other people's bands. So it was just, it finally took me, like I said, I turned 40 and I was sort of like, I have, uh, I have to get these songs out. Like I can't wait around anymore. Mm. And I luckily have musicians I get to play with that believe in these songs too. Even if we just had band practice and never got to play shows for me, I'd be like, Oh, this is amazing. But the fact that we get to open for bigger bands, that's like the sweet spot. I'll be all open for all these big names. Like it's amazing. And then their audience, you know, gets to experience what I'm sharing too. And it's, it's just been it's been amazing. So I have done my time with the shitty dive bars. I will say that. So, gotcha. <laughs> so well, and, and, and I certainly no disrespect to the, the, the trouble and toil that you've put into it. I'm glad you, you clarified that for me. So is the key then to this, you know, solo success for you uh, and the, the ramp up, if you will, mm-hmm. I, I think I read this between the lines in there. It's really that, that moment when you said, I'm going to start writing and playing for me. Yeah. And if people like it, that's fine. I'm not going to just follow the path and play yeah. the clubs and play what everybody else tells me to play. Is that kind of the, the key that unlocked all this? Yeah. I, I never minded getting older. And then when I, I'm 42 now, but when I was turning 40, it was really hitting me hard. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to die. We're all going to die. And I was just sort of like, shit. And then I, <laughs> now being in my forties, it's been amazing. Cause I really just had, I let go. I didn't really care what people thought before, but even more so now it's like, you get to a point where it's like, I, I, like I said, I have to play these songs or it's just like, it's better than therapy for me. It's just, it's my art and it is how I want to give these things to the world. And I choose what I want to put out there. And like I said, the people I play with are 
astounding. It's just the most seasoned musicians, and they make these songs come to life. So a lot of it is them, too. And playing solo is fun, but, man, I really love the people I play with. But, yeah, like, I think it just was – I'm not trying to fit into a certain genre. Americana seems to cover, like, the bases. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. you know, if something comes out a little more – know how to describe it i don't know how to describe it i don't think it sounds like other stuff especially this new ep you'll listen to it i don't think it sounds like a lot of stuff that's happening which maybe that's hard for people to put people want to put you in a category and when it doesn't fit into a certain category it's kind of confusing um but i'm just Mm -hmm. gonna keep doing it so (laughs) well and the reason i wanted to kind of pull that out is because i think it's a really interesting correlation to I don't know if you've read or or heard because the audiobook is fantastic. Um, the Creative Act by Rick Rubin. He talks in his yeah. book, um, obviously legendary record producer, that his his goal or the creative goal should never be focused on what the audience wants. Right. It should never be focused on what somebody else wants. It should be focused on what the artist wants, and and the artist needs to be satisfied with the finished product. Right. And if the world embraces it, that's fine. But it's really all about serving the artist's creative vision yeah. and let everything else happen. Yeah. And so it sounds to me like you've turned that corner. Yeah. And I just like, it's just been now dawning on me. Like it, it costs a lot of money to record and it costs a lot of like time to schedule practices and stuff. And I'm having a really big internal battle with, you just spend all this money to record and then you release it for free and other artists <laughs> you pay to buy their book and you pay to buy a painting, but like musicians are just like giving their art away. And it's like, Oh, I can't even afford to like make t-shirts because I spent all my money on recording, you know, it's cool. So, you know, that's the, uh, <laughs> the internal battle with making music. It's like, sure. I would be nice to be, it would be nice to be compensated. All musicians. I think we should all just take a big stand and fight the sure. system. I don't know. <laughs> Well, we're we're hoping that we are uh, supporting you and and other musicians in getting the word out there about your music Thank because you. the more people that are listening, the better chances you do have to make money off of what you're doing. So hopefully, we're helping a little bit, and we certainly do appreciate uh, your time. Tell tell people where they can uh, find you and all your stuffs on the interwebs. Uh, well, Sarah Jean Stevens, just across the board, Instagram, all the major streaming platforms that don't pay artists. Um, and on Bandcamp, which does pay. Um, and I'm not in it for the money. Let's be real. I'm not doing this for the money. But, you know, I would love artists to be compensated for their, for their work. But sure. um, I've got a show coming up on February 18th. It's a Sunday. We're doing uh, Judson and Moore, the Stone with the Jukebox folks are having mm-hmm. us come play, which has not been announced yet, but they told me I could say it on the show. And then cool. um, some stuff in the works, I hope, for March and April. And then in May, I'm opening for John Hyatt at Space, which is sold out because he's a legend. Yes, I yes. saw that. That's big. It's a rescheduled oh, one. That yes. was supposed to be last summer. And he had a little accident. So it's finally rescheduled. Right. Yeah. Well. That's what's coming up. Well, congratulations on that and break a leg because Thank that's you. that's no great pressure. to get in front of the audience no of some of those other artists. That's, <laughs> no that's good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Just John Hyatt. <laughs> no, no big deal. Be good. Yeah. Be great. Hey, you you fake it till you make it, and you're not faking it because <laughs> faking you it. know what you're doing. So get out there and break a leg. Uh, all right, we're going to uh, say goodbye to Sarah Jean and uh, play us out with another one of her cuts. This is also from Working Mother. We're excited about the new EP coming out here in the, the next few weeks. Yep. Uh, so be alert for that. We'll make sure we add that to the Roots Music Rambler uh, Spotify playlist as well when the new cuts come out. But this is uh, long gone. So, Sarah Jean, thanks for joining Thank us. And uh, here's that song. Thank, Thank you. you. His mama had it too, and they'll drink a bottle of that California wine, and they'll sing your brown eyes blue. They'll never get to climb up in the tree. I love that one.
Welcome back to Roots Music Rambler. Great talk there with uh, Sarah Jean Stevens. Make sure you click on all those links. Go check her music out. Uh, keep an eye out for that EP. We're excited about that, of course. Uh, it has uh, come time on the program where every episode, Frank and I do a little something called Picking the Grinning. Who's making us grin? Uh, we These might be new artists. They might be old artists. Just what, what music have we been listening to of late? that we want to share with you to point you to artists maybe you don't know, haven't found, haven't heard in a while. And so, uh, Frank, what you been, uh, what you been listening to lately? Oh, I, I was hoping you weren't going to ask me first. Um, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I don't care. Yeah. Well, you know, just with the holidays and stuff, I haven't really paid a whole lot of attention to anything new um, or really rediscovered old favorites or anything, you know, um, okay. I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks. <laughs> I can tell you that. Okay. Um, but yeah, maybe while you're talking and you're sharing, you're picking the grin and something will jog my memory and I can come up with something. Okay. Well, uh, I think on the last episode, uh, or it may have been two episodes ago, I forget sometimes, uh, we talked about, uh, WFPK, the public, uh, station right. here in Louisville, Kentucky, which I am a supporter of, love those guys at uh, Louisville Public Media. Um, they did a 2023 uh, top 91.9 albums. Uh, the point nine was the EP from Boy Genius. Uh, that's how they got got around that. But uh, they are 91.9 FM on the dial in Louisville, if you didn't put those two things together. But anyway, uh, so I decided I'm going to go through and listen to all 91.9 albums uh, in their entirety. That's a lot. Um, over the course of, you know, several weeks or months. It's going to take me a while, of course. But I wanted to see, okay, what did I miss? Are there artists out there that I haven't discovered that I really like? What songs should I add to my playlist? Which, by the way, I am I'm developing an Americana uh, playlist on Spotify that uh, you can, you can uh, subscribe to or whatever you do with playlists on Spotify. I don't know the terminology. But you can go play my playlist. And so we'll put the link in the show notes because what I'm doing is all of the songs that I like to listen to from the artists that I generally categorize as being Americana artists, which is a very broad definition in my, my, my case, I'm putting all those on a playlist and then I'm going through these albums and the ones, the songs that I think are really good, I'm putting on that playlist too. So you can sort of reap the benefits of the work and the research that I'm doing here. But anyway, Tough job, Long but story. someone's got to do it, right? I'm giving you plenty of time to think of something here, Frank. So you got to come up with something good. I'm so thinking, anyway, I'm I've been thinking. going through and listening to all of these albums. I'm through 23 of them so far, Wow. Um, which has been a, an adventure. It's been fun. And so, uh, and I've, I started with number one, which is Weather Vane's Jason Isbell. It didn't take me long to check that one off the list because I've already listened to it a hundred times. But um, the top, I'll, I'll go through and just give you a little snippets of a few of them because there's at one album and artist that I'm just going to say, go out and buy the goddamn album now because it's amazing. Um, one blew me away. A couple made me go, whoa, okay, I, I miss this person or I need to get into them. And then a couple I was like, eh, okay, whatever. So anyway, first the top, out of the top 23, remember there's 92 of these. Or, yeah, there's 92 different cuts. All right, Weather Vanes, Jason Isbell, I agree. Number one album of 2023, no problem. Um, and by the way, one of the ways that I judge how good these albums are is how many different tracks I put on my playlists. Yeah. And so Weather Vanes, uh, out of the how many ever songs are on that album, I put six on my playlists, uh, including Middle of the Morning, which was my favorite song of 2023. I think uh, Frank posted those things on one of our Instagrams or where it was, it wasn't your top. That was my, that was number two. I think it was number two. Uh, Tyler yeah. in your love was number one. In your love was number one. So middle of the morning, Jason was number two for the song of the year. Anyway, weather rains, fantastic. Uh, boy genius. The record was number two. And we've talked about boy genius ad nauseum on this show. I do like them. They're more of our daughter's era of, of musicians. I put three of those cuts though on my playlist and I think it's a very good album. I, I really enjoyed it and I'm listening to more boy genius these days Yay, um, welcome. And, and, and not ashamedly. So, so there you go. 
Uh, Rustin in the Rain, Tyler Childers is uh, the third one. There's only seven tracks on the album. I put five of the seven on my playlists. That's fair. Fantastic. Number four is Guts by Olivia Rodrigo. This is not an Americana album. And WFPK is not an Americana station. They play a lot of public sure. or a lot of uh, uh, indie artists. They play a little bit of everything. So it's a nice mix. It's kind of like a college radio station, but it's not. Um, Olivia Rodrigo, I put four of the cuts on this album on my kind of rock out playlist because I think um, that Olivia Rodrigo is this generation's Avril Lavigne or maybe Alanis Morissette. She's great. The I would songs say are, Alanis. Yeah. yeah. She, she's a badass. She is. I mean, that it's a it's a great album, and it's her second album. I've heard some cuts off her first one because Katie likes her. Yeah. And she's just really good. I was agreed. I was very, very happy with that. Uh, number five was uh, Cousin by Wilco. Now, I'm going to uh, sort of pause on this one and let you know that Frank and I are going to find a Wilco nutter, a crazy Wilco person, maybe who hosts a Wilco podcast or something like that to come on this show and explain Wilco to me because I don't get them. <laughs> I, I, I'm i never going to say someone's music sucks or is terrible right. because I know somebody out there likes them. I know a lot of people like Wilco. And there are several Wilco songs that I have on other playlists, but I I, I, I listened to this album and I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. And so I need someone to help me understand it. So I'm going to reserve judgment until i'm more intelligent about wilco because it didn't first glance didn't impress me but that's just me okay all right i'm gonna fast forward through a couple of these uh hackney diamonds rolling stones was on there it's a great stones album it, they they know how to record shit even at 80 years old and it sounds great <laughs> one song the lady gaga collaboration uh which is called the sweet sounds of heaven it reminds me of gimme shelter it's really really good so i, I liked it um, all right, here's a couple, I'll, I'll throw a couple more out and then I'll shut up and, and I'll get to the one that I want to talk about. All right. Here's my take on first two pages of Frankenstein by the national. <laughs> this is, uh, the national is the male version of those wispy teen angst songs that my daughter loves. So like Gracie Abrams and the slow Taylor Swift stuff where it's just and a piano. That's what the national is to me. It's the male version of that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. Some people like that. That's cool. I'm not one of them and that's okay. It's chamber pop. It's soft pop. It's very meditative, not bad, not, ne not necessarily bad. But here's my ultimate judgment of the national or what I would say about the national. In my opinion, if I were to go to a national concert, I would fall asleep. I saw your post on threads today <laughs> stating I that. Just, I, and, and again, good lyrics, good songs, but every single one of them was. So I get it. I get it. Just my opinion. Yeah. I'm not, again, I'm not saying anything bad about them. They they have an audience. They sell well. They do yeah. well. Good for they them. They have quite a following. Just my take on that one. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over the rest of them, and I'm gonna tell you guys right now. This is my picking and grinning pick of the year so far. Joy Oladokun, uh, Proof of Life. It's uh, uh, four sides, two discs. She has collaborations on here with uh, Noah Kahn, Mount Joy. Um, and Chris Stapleton and Sweet Symphony, the collaboration with Chris Stapleton might be one of my favorite songs ever. It's fantastic. I have played this. I went out, I went out and got the LP. That's how much I love it. Like this is, this is real vinyl. It actually came with a, a card in it that looks like it's signed. I don't think it's a real autograph. It might just be printed, but I was kind of impressed with that. Joy Oladokun is my new favorite artist and her, this album is so, positive it it the, the topics are thick the lyrics are about some disturbing things about her struggles in life yeah but the sound is just happy it's just positive and happy and you tap your feet and you snap your fingers and you sing along and it's outstanding absolutely outstanding wonderful wonderful i do enjoy what i've heard from joy um i haven't listened to the whole album yet 
but I, I plan to. Um, and I do like the song that she does with Noah Khan. That what is it? Uh, we're all gonna die or something. Yeah, it, the, it doesn't the, the sound Noah very Khan happy, one. but <laughs> it's uh, let's see, where is it? It's uh, yeah, we're all gonna die is the name of the song. Yeah. Um, it's also very good. The Mountain Joy collaboration is is very good as well. But there, the I mean, I literally just I put this in. I was playing it on Spotify, and the first song, keeping the light on. I'm like, oh, that's a really good, like, uplifting, positive, happy song. That's cool. And then the second song changes. I'm like, wow, that's really good. I've got a smile on my face. I'm liking that. <laughs> and then taking things for granted. And I'm like, oh my god, uh, that's a good song. Like four or five songs into it, I'm like, there's not a bad thing on here. Yeah. This is really good. And then I just kind of dove in and, and started watching YouTube videos and learning more about her. And this 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 is the the, the album right here. I, it's what I've been listening to for the last probably week, and it's awesome. So I highly recommend it. The other, the, the clever little quip I came up with about Joy Oladokun when I was first listening to it was, this is Tracy Chapman in a good mood. So there you go. <laughs> All right, Frank, you're up. What have you been listening to? Oh, there we go. Sorry, you're going to have to edit this out. Um, <coughs> I just got a coughing spell. Yeah, me too. Um, so I was muted. But I wanted to um, respond to what you said about her. Would you say Tracy Chapman if she were happy or whatever? Yeah, this is if Tracy Chapman. I'll, here. <clears throat> Tracy Chapman, if she were in a good mood. <laughs> I I have been laughing about that since you first shared it with me. And um I it's very clever and I would have to agree. I would definitely well, yeah. The the songwriting um uh, it, it it's it's up uh, it's up there, it's on par for sure. Yeah. Well and, and with all due respect to Tracy Chapman, I'm not implying that you're always in a bad mood or anything like that, but your songs are have a little melancholy to them. Yeah. These songs don't, even though they're still thick topics and whatnot. So, Fair all enough. right, you're you're off now. You're on the hook now, uh, Frank. What have you been listening to? What's uh, what you got for us? Um, yeah, <laughs> I can't even think. And I'm looking here. Let's look at my Spotify. Um, what have I listened to recently? Well, you got on a Coulter wall shirt. That's one thing. I That's do. Good. I do. And you know, I do love Coulter. Um, yeah. Um, here recently played. Oh, there's a lot of different stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I got nothing. Um, mm. we, and I think we talked about Noah Khan before, but, um, I've been listening to him a little bit more just in the car, you know, with Lucia, um, mm -hmm. cause we like him and we do like the song Northern attitude that he did with Hosier. Um, yep. so that's really nice. And Hosier, I, you know, he's been around for a really long time. Like you remember his first commercial hit, um, take me to church or yep. to me, that was the first commercial hit. That's the first one I remember. And I mean, this yeah. is going back several years. Um, that was 2013. That was 10 years ago, it, 11 years ago. Wow. Okay. You know, right. and I like the sound of that song, um, but I never really, you know, dove in. Um, mm -hmm. So, but he did release a song that is titled Francesca. And yep. so that, um, you know, that makes my antenna go up and um, it, it is, it's a lovely song. Never once says the name, it's just the title. And it's tied into uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, I was going to say it's all about you, but okay. Yeah, well, you know, not everything can be <laughs> about me or so I'm told. So, um, yeah, sorry. My pick of the grin <laughs> isn't very exciting this this episode. I'll have to, I'll have to do better. It's just, you know, you, coming off of holiday break. And, sure. Um, no, it's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I, I get it. I get it. And, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm really enjoying this uh, WFPK album exploration because it's really, I'm listening to stuff that I wouldn't listen yeah. to otherwise. Like the, the, the next album on the list, and then I'll, I'll break off a few of these in future episodes, of course, but uh, was uh, Mitski's uh, album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. And uh, I'd never heard of her, never heard any of her music. And it was like, I kept listening to it thinking, okay, this is very orchestral at times, but then 
it kind of moves into kind of a pop sound. And then there's some other influences that come in there. And what's really funny is I was thinking about how I would describe her music. And I basically said to myself, and I kind of jotted down some notes, the music seems to be looking for an identity without really finding one. And then I did more research about her. And it sounds like that might be a reflection of her life, that she's looking for an identity of her of her own based on her past and whatnot. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting insight that I kind of dug out of there myself. But uh, wow. But, you know, again, not not the, the, the music's good. It's a little esoteric, a little confusing for me. I'm not smart enough to understand her, I don't think. But, uh, you know. But you still have a very deep and philosophical um, evaluation. Let's put it that way. Well, of course I do. All right. So, all right. That's going to wrap it up for another uh, episode of Roots Music Rambler. Next time, Frank will come more prepared with picking and grinning stuff. Uh, Roots Music Rambler is a production of Falls and Partners. Copyright 2024 now. Our theme music is Sheepskin and Beeswax by Jint Decorum. Join us online at rootsmusicrambler.com and make sure you mash that subscribe or follow button so you remember to join us for the next hoedown and throwdown. She's Frank. He's Falls. And whatever you do, kids, ramble on. I'm surprised you. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't ask me about Deadwood because I wrote about going to jail. People always <laughs> want to know the jail story. So good. Oh well, uh, we're gonna ask oh, now. Now you we're walk, gonna talk about that. You walked yourself <laughs> right into that one, girl. <laughs> the most boring story, honestly, it was like some traffic violations. It was so dumb.